Uh, hi everyone, my name is Bennett, and today we're going to be talking about resource barriers and you. Um, resource barriers are a really important part of the Direct3D12 API. They influence and ensure correctness, um, and proper usage of them is also really important to get good performance. Um, so to start with, we're going to talk about what do resource barriers do, uh, why are they needed? So a resource barrier um, does three things in the Direct3D12 API. It can change the state of memory for a resource. Um, an example of this might be you'll have some hardware that can only read from a texture if it's in a certain format, but can only write to it if it's in a different format. So maybe when you do a resource barrier from render target to shader resource, you're asking the hardware to actually change the state of the memory. So it's very key to actually have that resource barrier in place so that the memory is changed so that the hardware can actually read from it. Um, it's for cache flushes. On certain hardware, maybe some of the writes are only going to certain parts of the cache, and other parts of the hardware needs to read from different areas of memory. To ensure coherency, um, depending on the type of barrier, you'll want to flush some of the caches and make sure the memory is visible to the right parts of the GPU that actually need to re read from it or write to it. Uh, and finally, they're responsible for pipeline stalls. So maybe you have a write, um, and you want to ensure that that write is finished before you want to read from it, um, maybe on the next draw call, for example. So in Direct3D12, one of the best cases of this, or one of the most obvious cases of this, is UAV barriers. So if you have two dispatches back to back, where you want all the writes to finish from the first dispatch um, before the second dispatch starts, you put a UAV barrier in there. And that means that the GPU is not allowed to pipeline these, so if you don't have the barrier, maybe it's letting the first dispatch run and then the second dispatch run, uh, which is great for perf, but not great for correctness if you need to read the results at the beginning of this before this is finished. So if you put the barrier in place, you'll get something like this. Um, so it's a little bit slower, but it's correct. Um, so it's, that's what barriers do. That's why they're important. Um, that's why they're important for correctness. Uh, and as you can kind of see, that's why they also impact performance quite a lot. So anytime you're asking the memory layout to change, the hardware's having to do something, flushing caches is obviously a little expensive, adding pipeline stalls, it might be needed, but it's going to make things a little bit slower than they would otherwise be. So there are three simple rules uh, to get correct barrier usage. And these rules uh, should definitely be followed. Um, you will see different behavior on different hardware if you are not following the rules. Um, and maybe if you're not following the rules, it's okay on all the hardware that's released today, but future hardware might have a problem. Um, and maybe the hardware you're running on, it doesn't really impact performance that much if you're not properly using the resource barriers, um, but it's difficult to make that assumption because other hardware might be having a, a challenge with it. So keep these three rules in mind. Uh, and everything will be great. You'll have good correctness and great performance. So the first rule, uh, avoid common and generic read states. So these states by their name imply that a resource can be used in a variety of situations. Generic read is actually the or of like five different states. So if you put a resource in generic read, you're saying, I want to use it as index buffer, or a constant buffer, or a vertex buffer, or as a pixel shader resource, or a non-pixel shader resource, or as an indirect argument buffer. So it's a ton of different things. So anytime you want to change, or if anytime you do change a resource to generic read, the hardware is going to go say, OK, this could be used all over the place. I'm going to have to flush a bunch of caches. I'm going to have to make sure I insert a pipeline stall. It's really expensive. And odds are you're not going to be using a single resource in like five different ways or six different ways. So really avoid this. Uh, the one exception is for upload heaps. Um, by their definition, you never transition an upload heap. You just create it in the generic read state. That's required, and that's obviously fine. 
it's really about transitioning between the generic read that is uh, problematic. So really try to avoid this. Um, just never use it. Uh, common, same deal. Uh, a common state implies that it can be used. Um, it can be used in a lot of different ways. You need to go to common for really two cases in particular, and otherwise you should avoid it. Uh, common is needed for CPU access to textures. So if you have a texture that is in CPU visible memory, and this is actually not very common, you have to really go out of your way to place a texture in CPU visible memory. Most of them are going to be in local video memory, which is not CPU accessible. If it is in that memory and you want to access it on the CPU, you want to make sure it's in a format that the CPU will be able to understand and that it's all writes have finished. And that's what the common state does. And that's a very expensive operation to make sure it's in the appropriate resource state and that all writes have finished. So common is good for CPU access and it's needed for cross engine transitions to the copy queue. So if you want to use a resource on the copy queue or the DMA queue, it has to be first transition to common. You can't just go directly to copy source and then expect to use it on the copy engine. This is kind of a special rule uh, because of hardware requirements. Um, uh, if you want to use it on the copy engine, uh, that's the only other time you really need to go to common. Otherwise, stay away from it. It'll imply decompresses, it'll insert all these cache flushes because the hardware doesn't really know where you're going to use it. It's by design a very generic state. So be very careful. Okay, so that's the first rule. Uh, the second rule, <laughs> we're going to add a second part to this rule. We're going to call it 1B. Uh, and that is always transition to the most constrained set of transition uh, of states that you can live with. Um, so it might be more convenient or, or easy in an engine to basically always transition to thinking of states as something like, okay, it's a render target and now I want to use it as an SRV. So like conceptually you're doing an RT to SRV transition. And in Direct3D12 there's actually two different states that correspond to an SRV. There is the pixel shader, 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 resource, and the non-pixel shader resource. So non-pixel shader, shader, so non-pixel shader obviously corresponding to vertex, hull, domain, geometry, and compute. So it is beneficial to only transition an SRV to the actual state that it's needed. Are you going to be using in the pixel shader? Great, only do this one. Are you going to be using on compute? Only do this one. Um, if you do both, the hardware isn't going to know if you need to consume it on compute, and so you need to wait for previous work to finish before it's visible to compute. It's going to do more work than you actually need to. Um, so while you're permitted to transition to both, only use the one that you need. Now, if you're going to be using it as an SRV first, as, a, as in a pixel shader, and then in a compute shader, you should go on and do go go to both. You don't want to do like RT to PS and then to non PS if you could have just done these in one step up front. Uh, but that's probably not going to happen most of the time. Most of the time, you're only going to be using a buffer in a compute shader, or you're only going to be consuming a render target, probably in a pixel shader. Um, so be very careful about that. Always use the most constrained set of states, and that's kind of a corollary to the uh, the generic read. Uh, staying away from generic read. That's why this only counts as one rule. All right. So I guess we'll leave this one written. Constrain states. Uh, the second one, avoid unneeded transitions. Um, this might Uh, unneeded transitions. And, you know, this kind of is implied by the fact that you're asking the GPU to do work with any of these, so, you know, don't ask the GPU to do work if you don't need to. Uh, this is really key, though. Um, there are many cases in engines where it can be convenient to do unneeded transitions. Um, maybe for multi-threading, you want to put a state, a resource in any kind of known state, 
at the end of the command list. So you can expect what state it's going to be in at the beginning of the next command list. You want to be really careful with that. Um, these transitions can be expensive. Uh, so really think carefully about how you can optimize your engine to avoid doing these transitions unless they're absolutely needed. Uh, so that one's pretty simple. Uh, the third one, what's the third one? Ah! Batch barriers. So conceptually, we talked about um, when you do a barrier telling the GPU, hey, flush these caches, maybe stall the pipeline, sort of pipeline bubble. Um, if you have two resource barriers back to back, um, you really don't want to do something like RT to SRV and then another one right after it. Uh, whatever, depth buffer <laughs> to SRV as well. Because um, what will happen is the, the driver, the user mode driver, will be writing out, okay, we need to flush some caches, we need to do a pipeline stall, and then on the next API call, oh, we need to flush some caches and do a pipeline stall. There's probably a lot of overlap with these, but it's very difficult for the driver to detect that if the app is doing these in several resource barrier calls. Uh, so the resource barrier API uh, actually accepts multiple barriers in the same API call. Um, so you can actually, the first argument is resource barrier, oops. So the first argument is the number of barriers you want to do. So always batch these together. The user mode driver can basically take the intersection of all these, or I guess the union of all these, and avoid doing kind of redundant operations back to back to back. This can really impact performance. Um, so definitely like when you're starting to write an engine, or writing an engine, and you, if you see barriers happening back to back, definitely optimize those out. If there are ways in which you can slightly reorder operations such that you can batch these together better, definitely worth it. If you have some kind of pattern where you're doing like resource barrier, copy, resource barrier, so this would be like, I don't know, SRV, copy dest, and then copy dest to SRV, and then you have another resource, resource barrier, and then the copy, and then another uh, the including barrier on that second resource, you should kind of reorder this so you can group these together and then group these together and just end up with two barrier calls and then kind of two copy calls. Uh, well, one barrier, two copies, and then another barrier. Uh, it lets the hardware pipeline things a little bit better. It's just more efficient. Um, so those are the three rules. Uh, constrained states that you're going to. Be very, very, very careful about generic read and common. Common in particular. Common is kind of a, a superset of generic read you could think of. Uh, unneeded transitions, of course, avoid these. Be really careful in your engine. Anytime you're doing a transition, you're asking the driver to do something. Uh, so certainly avoid that when it's not needed. Uh, and batch barriers. Let the driver uh, have the opportunity to coalesce operations uh, to avoid unneeded cache flushes and uh, pipeline stalls. So those are the three rules. Uh, there's a bonus, uh, a fourth rule. Bonus. Uh, there is a, in the API, there is the ability to basically take a barrier and split it. Um, we call them split barriers. So if you look on, a, on the barrier API, there's this flags uh, field in the struct and basically says, I can make a barrier begin only and end only. And the idea of a begin only, end only barrier is basically say, okay, I'm going to start. Hmm, I'm going to start transitioning from, let's say, start depth right, and I want to go to SRV. So we'll say specifically pixel shader resource. So this resource, uh, this barrier can be pretty expensive. Maybe the hardware needs to do a decompress on the compressed depth data to have it in a forum where it can be read by the pixel shader unit or the texture unit. Um, so if you say, hey, I'm going to start doing this, and then maybe some time goes by. Maybe you're doing other, other work. And then time goes on, and you say, OK, now I need to use this, actually. So now I need to end the barrier. 
And now you say again, I'm ending that same depth right to a pixel. So if you do this, and then now we're actually like, you know, consume. So now you're actually using the depth of her. So if you do this, two really cool things can happen. The first is maybe this barrier needs like a pipeline stall. Uh, so if you do the start and end semantic, uh, and I should back up and say, when you do a start and an end semantic, you're basically promising the driver, you're not gonna use the, the resource in the middle here between the start and the end. So if you do the start and the end, um, and normally the barrier require a wait for idle, the driver can say, okay, between the start and the end, I'm gonna see if another operation is causing a cache flush or a wait for idle to happen. Because if it does happen, then I know by end time, I've already satisfied the correctness requirements here. I don't need to go and do something. So, you know, if this was on the only barrier, you would be doing something redundant. The start and the end allows it to uh, avoid that unneeded step. And the other really big thing is, um, if it's a decompress, like going from depth right to pixel shader resource, some hardware can actually be doing this decompress in the background, like asynchronously during this other work. Um, so by the time end shows up, um, hey, it's already done, great. There is no cost here. It's actually a free operation. So split barriers are most important for when you are doing these kind of memory state transitions. And these are typically going to be going from like, typically going from render target or depth to some kind of shader read state. Um, so you know, this is a typical thing, a uh, difficult thing to put in the engines, but definitely be on the lookout for cases where you're writing to a render target or depth buffer, and then you know you're going to need it in the future, but you don't need it right away. Um, this can be a really uh, great way to get back some performance. Um, so that's actually really it. Uh, thanks for watching. Um, and uh, please ask questions on the DirectX 12 forums if there are any uh, questions around barrier best practices uh, and share what you see. Uh, thanks.